we're going to start talking here about prenatal care and we'll start by talking about the first trimester visit. Now this could be easily called the first trimester visits because in many cases a woman will have more than one visit during the first trimester. Uh, but we're going to talk about all the things that need to be done during uh, the first trimester as far as labs and advice that you'll want to give. Now, as always, I want to preface this, but most importantly here, by indicating that this is only for medical education purposes. So if you are a woman who is pregnant and if you're watching this, this is not to substitute for uh, medical advice from your own physician. So please bear that in mind. This is informational only. So the recommended timeline for prenatal care is that upon diagnosis of pregnancy that a checkup be done every four weeks until 28 weeks gestation, uh, and then every two weeks thereafter until 36 weeks, and then every week from 36 weeks to birth. So note that at 28 weeks you're already getting close, uh, you're already actually well within uh, the third trimester. So you're doing monthly visits up into about the third trimester and then uh, more frequent visits thereafter. And this is just a general guideline. If there are complications in the pregnancy, you're going to want more frequent visits. This is a, a minimum. So we're going to talk about the purpose of the first trimester visit, really the purpose of prenatal care in general. We'll talk about the history and physical examination, which is going to be important, particularly at the initial visit. We'll talk about the labs that are done during the first trimester as well as common complaints and patient education. You'll want to definitely be aware of how we educate the patient uh, during the first trimester because this is not only going to be important for clinical practice, but knowing these things is going to be important uh, for educating your patient for the remainder of her pregnancy. So this is a uh, sort of a table that I found uh, in the literature. Uh, you can see here that, and these aren't necessarily when the visits are going to happen, uh, but you can see here that during the initial visit and the, uh, the other first trimester visit, uh, you're doing pretty much all of these labs. Okay. So the goals of prenatal care, first and foremost, is to diagnose, really confirm the pregnancy, which is going to be done at the initial visit, and then get an estimation of the gestational age, which can be done by Nagel's rule first. And that really is only going to be useful, however, if the woman has regular menses. So if she has regular four-week cycles, regular five-week cycles, regular three-week cycles, uh, then with that, we have a general idea of how... Uh, how we can uh, date the pregnancy. Uh, remember that Nagel's rule assumes a four-week cycle, uh, so you'll have to adjust that if her cycles are, are, are less or more than four weeks. If she has irregular periods, then you're going to need to rely on sonographic evidence, and really sonographic evidence is the most accurate way of dating a pregnancy. And it's that first trimester ultrasound that's going to be most accurate. As the ultrasounds progress, as you get later in the pregnancy, they become less reliable. During prenatal care, you want to be able to identify any uh, potential complications. And then uh, we also provide ongoing evaluation of the health status of both mother and baby. Uh, we anticipate problems and uh, give intervention if possible to prevent or minimize morbidity, and then of course patient education and communication are going to be paramount. So the first trimester includes everything between conception and the completion of the 12th week. This illustration here is approximately what uh, an infant uh, or of what a fetus would look like uh, at about 12 weeks gestation. Towards the end of the first trimester, the patient can be offered an ultrasound along with some maternal blood tests, which tests for HCG, AFP, which is alpha fetal protein, and then PAPPA, pregnancy associated paraprotein A levels. So you get ultrasound looking for nuchal translucency, and then also these three markers. And together, uh, you can get an idea of whether or not there is chromosomal issues or even heart defects. And this is known as the quote-unquote first trimester screen, and it should not be confused with something we're going to talk about when we talk about the second trimester visit, 
which is the triple screen, triple screen or the quad screen. And the quad screen is looking for HCG, AFP, estriol, and inhibin A. That's totally different. Okay, so some OBGYNs will do both the first trimester screen and that second trimester screen, the quad screen. Uh, there's conflicting evidence in the literature as to whether uh, one is more accurate than the other, but from what I've read, actually doing both is the best. Uh, but I haven't seen any test questions that address uh, the first trimester screen, at least on USMLE tests. Uh, so I don't expect that you should have to know this, uh, but you should know that it's around and it's being used more and more frequently, particularly in the last 10 years. Okay, so history in physical is going to be very important because this is going to help you get a baseline as well as help you sniff out any potential complications that may happen during the pregnancy. So first and foremost, we want to know the obstetric history. Uh, so we want to know how many pregnancies she's had and uh, sort of the course of them. So how uh, were there any complications? Did she have preeclampsia? Did she have gestational hypertension? Did she have gestational diabetes? How long did they last? At what point did she deliver? Has she had any spontaneous abortions? What was the course for the baby uh, after birth? Uh, were, were there any problems? Low APGAR scores? Uh, any issues with breathing? Uh, so that's all going to be part of the obstetric history. You also want to know previous deliveries and their mode. Namely, have they all been vaginal deliveries? Has she had C-sections? If she did have C-sections, what kind of C-sections? Were they emergent C-sections? Uh, were they, uh, what was the incision type of the C-section? Most of the time now, they do the low transverse incision, the fan and steel incision. Uh, in which case, if she's only had one, she can go on to do a VBAC or vaginal birth after C-section. That's possible, but if she's had two uh, C-sections, then all subsequent deliveries need to be C-sections. There's some stuff in the literature that suggests that maybe it is possible to do a vaginal delivery after more than one C-section, but prevailing wisdom right now is that if you've had one uh, one C-section, you can do a vaginal delivery. If you have more than one, then they all need to be C-sections after that because of the risk of uterine rupture. The gynecologic history is going to be useful for understanding how we possibly are going to date the pregnancy, namely if she has an irregular menstrual cycle pattern, then we're going to need to rely on sonographic evidence in order to date the pregnancy. You'll have to do a transvaginal ultrasound at that point in the pregnancy. The sexual history uh, can be useful to sniff out any possibility of sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, that's going to be important as far as what STDs we screen for. There's a, a set of STDs that we screen for. Uh, however, if she has a more promiscuous sexual history, we may screen for other things like hepatitis C uh, and syphilis as well. Uh, past medical history, including things like chronic illnesses, particularly diabetes, hypertension, uh, heart problems, thyroid problems, seizure disorders, anemia, psychiatric issues. Family history. We want to know if there's any inherited diseases within the family, like cystic fibrosis or fragile X syndrome. Uh, we want to know if there are any siblings that had birth defects, any perinatal uh, deaths, miscarriages, etc. And then we also want to know about her lifestyle. So does she abuse any illicit drugs? Does she take any prescription drugs that aren't prescribed to her? How often does she drink? Has she stopped drinking? Does she travel? This is important in this day and age, especially with the Zika virus going around. The Zika virus uh, has reared its ugly head in the state of Florida. And so that's not an uncommon place for people to go, especially this this time of year when I'm recording this, which is in January, uh, lots of people go down that way. Um, and so if there is any history of travel, either on her part or on any sexual partner's part, uh, that is something we want to be aware of. What about her support structure? Is the partner, the father, uh, is he there? Is he supportive? Does she have good financial support? Is there any history of physical or sexual abuse? That has been associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes. Uh, as a matter of fact, the most common point for a woman to be physically abused by a partner is during pregnancy. And then is there any teratogenic exposure? This can be uh, based on her profession uh, or it can be uh, from prescription medications.
namely going back to seizures, uh, some of those anti-epileptic drugs can be associated with neural tube defects. So the initial physical exam is important to attain a baseline impression of the patient, uh, and then you can compare that if any changes come up uh, when you're evaluating for pregnancy disorders. So the important elements are going to be the BMI, and the BMI is going to help you discern how much weight she should be gaining. Uh, so if the BMI is more than 29, we expect that she only is going to gain around 15 pounds during the pregnancy. However, if her BMI is uh, less than 15, she's very underweight, then we expect her to gain closer to 40 pounds during the pregnancy. So you can see how the BMI is going to affect that. Also, being overweight raises your risk of gestational diabetes as well. Blood pressure, obviously important, because we want to know if her blood pressure was normal but then has gone up. That should never happen. Blood pressure should go down during pregnancy. So if there's an increase in blood pressure, we want to look at other things um, that may point us towards possibly preeclampsia or gestational hypertension. Pelvic exam. So we want to look for masses. We want to assess the cervical length. We want to... Uh, get an idea of the size, position, contour of the uterus, uh, feel the adnexa for masses. Uh, the thyroid, breasts, and skin are also going to be places where we want to uh, keep an eye on as well. Okay, so these are a list of the labs that we do during the first trimester visit. Uh, I just sort of divided these red here, really looking at the blood, the green are looking at infections, and then the blue uh, are other, I guess. Okay, maybe that helps, or maybe not, I don't know. But these are uh, the labs that we do. Now, there are some additional ones you may get depending on the circumstance, and I'll talk about that as it comes up. So first, we want to get a CBC. And why do we want to get a CBC? Because one of the more common complications of pregnancy is iron deficiency anemia. So hemoglobin, hemoglobin and hematocrit are going to help us evaluate for anemia which may proceed or arise during the pregnancy. Now keep in mind, if you watch the talk on the physiology of pregnancy, the hemoglobin normally drops during pregnancy because of dilution, because the plasma volume goes up. So a hemoglobin over 10 and a half or over 10 even is perfectly normal during pregnancy, even though that would technically be considered anemic uh, otherwise. Uh, so we're really talking about hemoglobins of 8 or 9 where uh, we're considering the patient to be anemic. And if the patient is indeed anemic, then the next thing we want to look at is the MCV, just like normal. So if the MCV is low, then we consider that a microcytic anemia and we'll obtain iron studies. If the iron studies come back consistent with an iron deficiency anemia, then we make that diagnosis. We want to make sure that the woman is on iron supplementation. If However, you had a microcytic anemia and the iron studies were normal, then the most likely diagnosis in that case would be a thalassemia. Uh, platelets should not change during the pregnancy. If it's low, it may indicate uh, an ITP or a pregnancy-induced thrombocytopenia, and you'll just want to keep an eye on. Usually it's not terribly severe. White blood cell count typically elevates during pregnancy. 16 is the upper limit of normal. Uh, if there is a uh, leukopenia, it suggests possibly an immunodeficiency or a leukemia. Okay, this is also going to be very important when we're talking about pregnancy, namely for protection of baby. So blood type, Rh factor, and atypical antibody test. So starting off with blood type, and this is pretty simple. If she is Rh positive, for the most part you can stop there. What we're mostly concerned about here by, when we're doing this is isoimmunization. So remember, isoimmunization is where mom is Rh negative, baby is Rh positive, mom gets exposed to some of baby's blood, and she makes antibodies against it. That's not a problem for the first pregnancy. But the second pregnancy that she has uh, an Rh positive baby, uh, then those antibodies that were already preformed, that she's already made, are going to cross the placenta and attack baby's blood cells. Okay, so starting out, blood type. If she's Rh negative, then we want to know uh, after that, then uh, does she have those antibodies from a previous pregnancy? 
Uh, and if indeed she does, then there's the possibility of isoimmunization, and we will need to do further uh, surveillance uh, for the possibility of isoimmunization. Now, she'll need to get, uh, if in, on the other hand, if she doesn't have the atypical antibodies, but she is Rh negative, then she'll need to get Rogam later on in the pregnancy uh, to prevent making these antibodies so that this doesn't cause problems in subsequent pregnancies. Okay. Next thing that we want to be aware of is rubella and varicella IgG. Most women are going to be positive for the rubella and the varicella IgGs because of past immunization or exposure. Typically for rubella in the United States, it's going to be due to immunization. Uh, the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella is a very common vaccine that's given during childhood. Um, on the other hand, varicella vaccine, most people do get it, but a lot of people, uh, especially in my generation, mid-upper 20s, uh, either got chicken pox or got the immunization. I actually happened to get the immunization, so I never had chicken pox, but a lot of my friends did. Either way, uh, we generally want to see a positive rubella and varicella IgG. That doesn't mean they're infected, it means they're immune. And if they're immune, it means they're not going to get infected during pregnancy, and that's a good thing. So a positive ru rubella and varicella IgG are indicative of immunity, and that's what we want to see. Now, what happens if they're, if they're negative? It means they're susceptible to getting infected during pregnancy, and that can have adverse outcomes on the fetus. Uh, however, even if they are negative, we can't give them the vaccine because both the rube rubella and varicella vaccines are live attenuated viruses and therefore they are not safe during pregnancy. So that's a good uh, time to talk about which vaccines are safe and unsafe during pregnancy. So definitely safe would be influenza. All pregnant women should get the flu shot if it's that time of the year. Uh, the hepatitis B and hepatitis A vaccines pneumococcus, meningococcus, and typhoid. Okay, so uh, these four in the middle are indicated in certain circumstances. Typhoid, we pretty much never do in the U.S., but all pregnant women should get the influenza vaccine. Unsafe is MMR, polio, varicella, and yellow fever. We don't do the yellow fever one in the U.S., but we definitely do do MMR, polio, and varicella. Okay, hepatitis B screen. All women should be screened for hepatitis B, even if they have already been vaccinated, because there's a possibility of being exposed prior to immunization. And if you are already exposed and then you got immunized, the immunization is not going to do anything for you, and you may possibly have chronic hepatitis B despite the fact that you were immunized. So all women, even if they've already been immunized, should get a hepatitis B screen. And we're doing a panel uh, we're looking at antibodies and antigens and then making a diagnosis from that, uh, whether or not they're immune or whether or not they have been infected. And if so, is it acute or chronic? Uh, and the way that we interpret this panel is the exact same way you would in anybody else. Okay, so here's how we do it. We have a hepatitis B surface antigen, which is indicative. If that's positive, then there is hepatitis B disease going on. Uh, anti-HBC IgM, which is indicative of acute infection, anti-HBC, uh, which is indicative of exposure to the hepatitis B, and then anti-HB surface uh, antibody, which is uh, indicative of immunity. So here's uh, how this panel works. Uh, what we want to be aware of is whether or not there is active infection, be it acute or chronic. So if the hepatitis B surface antigen is positive, then we know we have active infection. And that's really the one that we want to be looking out for because if there is a positive hepatitis B surface antigen, then there is an increased risk of vertical transmission from mom to baby. So if there is a positive hepatitis B surface antigen, then our very next step is going to be liver function tests on mom to determine uh, what her liver functioning is. And then once the baby is born, we're immediately going to give baby hepatitis B immunoglobulin to try to get rid of any of the virus so that baby does not develop hepatitis B. 
We also want to do an STD screen. Now these are the ones that we're always going to get. We are always going to get an HIV test with a little caveat there, which we'll talk about in a little bit. We're always going to get, um, well, I should say in most cases, we're going to get cervical swabs for chlamydia and gonorrhea. And then in some cases, we'll get syphilis and <clears throat> hepatitis C screen. Okay, so let's start with HIV. ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, recommends that all pregnant women be screened for HIV as early as possible during each pregnancy. Now, they recommend the opt-out approach rather than the opt-in approach. Uh, opt-out means that a woman has to sign a waiver that she wants to decline it. Opt-in means that she has to sign a waiver that she wants to accept it. You can imagine then that women are probably going to be more likely to get the test if they don't have to sign something. Uh, so the problem though is in some jurisdictions, in some states, it has to be an opt-in uh, opt test uh, where you have to actually volunteer to do it. Um, but ACOG recommends the opt-out approach where it's done except for when the woman actively does not want to have the HIV test done. Okay, so, uh, but in a lot of states in this country, it is an opt-out test. Sorry, an opt-in test. Okay, so a little bit more restrictive. Anyways, uh, the HIV screening test that we get is called an ELISA. If ELISA comes back positive, then we get a Western blot. There are about 10% or so uh, of ELISAs. Uh, that come back positive that are actually false positives, like 1 to 10%. Um, but if it does come back positive, you get a Western blot. If that comes back positive, then our very next step is going to be to get an HIV viral load count, and we will put the woman on, uh, on antiretroviral therapy during the pregnancy to suppress her viral load count. Most of those, will you'll be able to go on and do vaginal deliveries. Uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea. The recommendations here from ACOG is that we screen all pregnant women for chlamydia and gonorrhea during pregnancy. Uh, and you'll do this via, via cervical swabs. However, some places, uh, some authorities do say that you can do a urine NAAT uh, for chlamydia and gonorrhea. The United States Preventative Services Task Force recommends screening all women who fit certain criteria. So if they're 24 years of age or younger, or if they are a woman who's at increased risk. So things like a new sex partner, more than one, uh, history of STDs in the past, illicit drug use, and so forth. Other STDs can be investigated based on risk factors uh, and on their history. So some Authorities recommend screening all women for syphilis by getting a VDRL. Uh, some recommend screening women for hepatitis C. It really just depends on uh, the source. Uh, but at the very minimum, HIV, chlamydia, and gonorrhea, um, and then hepatitis B, you can consider that an STD as well. Those are all going to be screened. A urinalysis in culture is going to be important for two different things. Uh, first off, you want to get an idea of her renal function. So you, there is the possibility later on of developing renal dysfunction in the pregnancy. So you want to know, is there any glucosuria, is there any proteinuria, is there any blood in the urine? Uh, because if there is renal disease later on, then you can compare it back to your baseline labs. The other important thing is to know whether or not there is bacteria in the urine. This is something called asymptomatic bacteriuria, where you don't have any symptoms of a urinary tract infection, but there is indeed bacteria in the urine. Now, a lot of people have this, but in pregnancy, it can be particularly problematic because with asymptomatic bacteriuria, because of the urinary stasis, you have an increased risk of then developing pyelonephritis, which itself is associated with preterm labor. So you want to know immediately if there is asymptomatic bacteriuria so that you can treat it immediately. And there's all sorts of reasons why there's increased risk of urinary tract infection and pyelonephritis during pregnancy. Um, one of those reasons is urinary stasis. Another reason is compression of the fetal head onto the bladder. Uh, so there's all sorts of reasons, really. Uh, but very important that you're getting a urinalysis and culture and treating asymptomatic bacteriuria if the culture 
grows bacteria. Now, even if the nitrites and esterases are negative, if you get a positive culture, you're going to be treating uh, the bacteria. And what you'll treat it with is something just as simple as Augmentin 7 to 10 days. All right, uh, asymptomatic bacteria needs to be immediately treated because of its increased uh, association with preterm labor. So hopefully I drove that into your head. Okay, and then finally the pap smear. So women who are due for a pap smear should be offered one at their first visit, but it's not necessary to change the schedule. You don't have to do a pap smear on a woman who is already up to date on her screening. Okay, so really we're just treating the visit as sort of a well woman checkup as well as a first prenatal visit. Now, I've seen some sources talking about tuberculosis testing. And according to, I believe, ACOG, but uh, also the AAFP, is that tuberculosis testing is only indicated for women who are immunocompromised uh, and for those who have close contact with those who have active TB. Uh, so it's not universally recommended. If you do TB testing, you can do a Manto test. And if the Manto test comes back positive, you'll do a chest x-ray. If the chest x-ray comes back positive, then you're going to need to do uh, a therapy with multiple uh, anti-TB drugs. Uh, and that will last for about a year. Those are all safe during pregnancy. Uh, if the TB test uh, comes back positive and you have a negative chest x-ray, uh, then in that case uh, you will do INH and uh, vitamin B6 for nine months. Okay. So some common complaints during the first trimester, uh, breast enlargement and tenderness, uh, probably due to the changes in hormones, namely estrogen. Uh, nausea, vomiting, and morning sickness, very common during the first trimester, tends to abate around 12 to 14 weeks of pregnancy as, that, uh, as the beta HCG levels uh, begin to drop after their peak at 10 weeks. Fatigue. Very common, probably due to uh, increased metabolic demand, decreased blood pressure. Uh, you, a lot of times women, if they don't know they're pregnant yet, they're not eating as much uh, as they should be, and so that can cause fatigue as well. Uh, gingival bleeding, migraine-like headaches, also probably due to hormones, and dizziness. Uh, how do we treat these? For the breast enlargement and tenderness, a support bra tends to do pretty well. Uh, for the nausea, vomiting, and morning sickness, here if we're talking about just your typical morning sickness from pregnancy, uh, then you can do frequent snacking, carbs, sort of, you know, soda crackers work well for that. Very simple carbs, they can carry them around with them. Uh, if you need to, you can do uh, an antiemetic, like an antihistamine. Uh, they do uh, a um, doxylamine is the best for uh, during pregnancy, which is Unisom. Uh, fatigue, obviously just getting adequate rest. Gingival bleeding, really not a whole lot to be done about that, just conservative management. The migraine-like headaches, you can do ice packs, massage. Medications are really a last resort, though. And then dizziness, just adequate hydration and avoiding rapid <clears throat> postural changes. Okay, so the normal events that happen during the first trimester, as already mentioned, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, breast tenderness, urinary frequency. Spotting and bleeding occurs in about 20% of pregnancies half of these pregnancies will still progress normally. So really 10% of pregnancies will have, will be completely normal, but have some spotting or bleeding. So some degree of reassurance is okay in these patients. Just make sure that they're aware of the symptoms, uh, the other symptoms of a threatened or spontaneous abortion. Average weight gain is about 5 to 8 pounds during the first trimester. However, that will vary based on the woman's pre-pregnancy weight. And the most common complication during the first trimester is a spontaneous abortion. So patient education is going to be very important when a woman comes in for her first visit. So first off, you need to explain to her how much and how she should be eating. 
So during the first trimester, 2300 calories and 55 grams of protein is indicated for most women. So this would be the advice I would give to you're the average woman that comes in. What is the calorie, recommended calorie amount for the average person uh, in general? About 1900 to 2100 calories per day. Um, so obviously an increased caloric intake is going to be important. What about protein? How, how many grams of protein is somebody expected to eat in a day? About 40 to 45 grams. So 55 grams of protein is indicated during pregnancy. You can see then increased uh, nutritional uh, demand during pregnancy. Caffeine should be limited to less than 150 to 300 milligrams per day. That's like two cups of coffee or so. Certain foods should be avoided. High mercury fishes, things like shark, king mackerel, avoid that. Other things like uh, shrimp, uh, albacore, um, salmon, they're okay in small quantities. Liver should be avoided because of the vitamin A toxicity that can result from that. Anything undercooked because of the possibility of foodborne illnesses and saccharin should also be avoided. Saccharin is an artificial sweetener. Okay, um, and I should say that caffeine, the reason you want to avoid that is because there is some association with uh, low birth weight and spontaneous abortion. Uh, so there are certain supplements that should be avoided. Chamomile, licorice, peppermint, raspberry leaf. Uh, these should be avoided because they are associated with preterm labor and uh, spontaneous abortion. Vitamin supplementation is highly recommended, so there's those prenatal or pregnancy vitamins that can be taken. Uh, you want to make sure that she's getting 600 micrograms of folate per day. Her requirements of folate go up about 50% during pregnancy. That could be even up to 800 uh, micrograms per day would be good too. It's really hard to get too much folate. Uh, so at least 600 micrograms a day. Iron, she should be getting about 27 milligrams a day. Again, this is going up by about 50-60% from what one would normally require. Uh, the folate and iron are both important for, uh, for red blood cell formation. The folate itself is very important for preventing neural tube defects. Weight gain should be around 6 to 15 pounds during the first trimester, and that's going to vary based on the woman's pre-pregnancy weight. Safety measures, so we want to make sure that she is safe at home. Uh, is there any abuse? We want to know if that's the case, because if there is, we want to make sure she has resources on where she can go. Remember, like I said, that physical abuse uh, goes up when a woman is pregnant. It's more likely to happen than when she's not pregnant. So that's important to bear in mind. Tobacco cessation, why? because tobacco is associated with more than 4,600 perinatal deaths per year. So smoking tobacco is bad. It doesn't cause birth defects so much as it is just associated with, with problems during the pregnancy and problems for the baby after the pregnancy. Alcohol, on the other hand, is associated with birth defects, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, we want her to abstain from alcohol during the pregnancy. Seatbelt use is important because if there is a car accident, it's the, uh, and I should say that's a three-point uh, seatbelt, so the one that goes over the shoulder, not the one that just goes around the waist, because if there happened to be a car accident, we don't want all that pressure going on the waist. Uh, so that's going to be important as well. Uh, a woman, often women will come to you asking if they can exercise during pregnancy, and the ab answer is absolutely. However, certain activities need to be avoided. So very strenuous activities should be avoided if there have been certain complications in previous pregnancies. So if she's had more than three spontaneous abortions, premature rupture of membranes, preterm labor, uh, cervical insufficiency, placenta previa, or IUGR, then she should avoid strenuous activity. All women, however, should avoid any kind of contact sports because that can be traumatic uh, to the uterus and to the developing fetus. You should discuss safe versus unsafe over-the-counter medications. So if she has some pain, make sure she's taking Tylenol and not ibuprofen. NSAIDs have to be avoided during pregnancy. Discuss symptoms of infection. So it is possible to develop infection during pregnancy. 
Uh, she should know that fever, chills, dysuria, hematuria are all indicative of infection. What are we looking for here mostly? Pyelonephritis. Discuss symptoms of threatened loss. Remember the number one complication during the first trimester is spontaneous abortion. So things she should be looking for here are vaginal bleeding, cramping, passage of tissue. And then refer her to social services as needed if she's low socioeconomic status. Uh, things exist in this country such as the WIC program, women, infants, and children, uh, which help her get nutritional uh, resources uh, for during her pregnancy and while she has children. What should be avoided during pregnancy? Kids with chicken pox. Remember, if she is has never been exposed to varicella, and she comes in contact with a ch kid with chicken pox, bad news. Kitty litter. Why? Toxoplasmosis. Hot tubs and saunas. Oh, I love saunas. They're great this time of year. But they should be avoided by pregnant women. Not exactly sure why. Probably the heat, maybe. But they should be avoided by pregnant women. What else should be avoided? Contact sports and roller coasters. Why? Well, look at that. They got that two-point seat belt there. And also just the jerking motion and everything is not good for the pregnancy. Alrighty. So that's all I got for you. Next, we'll talk about the second trimester.